This week on ANN, progress on an Adventist theology of ordination. A young Adventist man in Pakistan faces life in prison after a wrongful conviction. And an Adventist church in Ghana adopts an underprivileged community. These stories and more, coming up. This is ANN, a service of the Seventh-day Adventist World Church. Thanks so much for joining us this week. First in the news, the Church's Theology of Ordination Study Committee agreed this week to approve a consensus statement on a distinctly Adventist theology of ordination. The statement passed by a vote of 86 to 8. It defines ordination as an action taken by the Church to publicly recognize those God has called to ministry. The statement also offers biblical examples of ordination and explains the role of ordained ministers. Christ's ministry on earth is designated as the ultimate example of ministerial service. The approval of the document came in the middle of a three-day meeting of the Theology of Ordination Study Committee outside Baltimore in the U.S. state of Maryland. Delegates spent each day reviewing dozens of scholarly articles on ordination that cover a wide variety of thought and opinion on the subject. The consensus statement is an expression of unity church leaders hope the delegates maintain as they navigate more challenging issues surrounding ordination. A court in Pakistan sentenced a young Adventist man to life in prison last week for allegedly defaming the Prophet Muhammad. The case falls under the country's controversial blasphemy laws. Sajad Masi was convicted of sending blasphemous text messages to Muslim clerics two years ago. Church leaders and many international news agencies have pointed out that a search of the young man's home and cell phone records produced no evidence linking him to the case, and his accuser has since recanted his testimony. Masi is widely believed to have been framed. Human rights activists say Pakistan's blasphemy laws are notoriously used to oppress religious minorities in the country. Masi's lawyer is expected to appeal the ruling at a higher court. The Adventist Church in South America this week surpassed 20 million downloads of The Great Hope. The book is a modern retelling of church co-founder Ellen White's book, The Great Controversy. Publishing leaders say growing interest in downloads marks a change in traditional book distribution. This is a good news for us because when you give a book to somebody, sometimes the person just receives because, you know, the person wants to be polite with you. But those that are going there and to download the books is because they want the book. It's a, it's a new opportunity for us because when they go the, do the download, we also can collect some information about this person. That person is a client that we can communicate later. Valley View University Adventist Church in Accra is donating clothing, food, and books to residents of Okotokwa, a remote village in central Ghana. Okotokwa is one of the country's poorest communities. The campus church decided to adopt the community after an Adventist theology student discovered its growing needs. Adventists have also offered free health screenings and counseling services to community members. The campus cafeteria pitched in by providing free meals to Okotokwa residents. Michael Kobena Lois, assistant chaplain for the school, said church members are fulfilling their social responsibility to share Christ in practical ways. And finally in the news this week, new details are emerging in the case of an Adventist pastor arbitrarily detained in Togo without evidence or a trial. Antonio Montero was imprisoned more than a year ago for a crime church officials say he didn't commit. A written statement obtained by ANN indicates that Montero's judge agrees. He admitted that Montero was innocent, but that releasing the pastor wasn't up to him. And according to police reports, the man who accused Montero of heading up a blood trafficking network is a convicted criminal with a history of mental instability. Later, the man tried to recant his testimony, claiming police had forced him to give names. The new details have galvanized advocates working to secure Montero's release. Earlier today, I sat down with Dwayne Leslie to learn more. He's part of a working group raising awareness of the case. Thanks for joining us, Dwayne. Thanks for having me here. Church leaders have called for a global day of prayer um, for Montero's release on July 27. What is the significance of that date? July 27 actually marks day 500 of his unlawful detainment in uh, Togo prison. And while we originally had a first day of prayer back in December of last year, we, we thought it important to bring it back again to uh, our world viewership to uh, highlight the fact that he still remains in prison. What do you hope a global event like this will achieve? The thought is that it would really continue to galvanize uh, the viewing public to do something. Um, he remains in jail for 500 days, and while we've had hopes of, of progress, uh, there really hasn't been any definitive movement forward, and so we really want to continue to encourage people to get active and to don't forget our brother in prison. 
What resources are available for local Adventists who want to help bring awareness to the cause? The General Conference has actually created a website, uh, PrayForTogo.com, which is really your one-stop shop for everything about this case. It gives you the background information. It also gives you a PowerPoint presentation that you can download to use uh, during the service on Sabbath. Uh, you can also have a, a video, a four-minute video, which really puts a human face on the suffering. It interviews Pastor Montero's wife and his family, and it really highlights the struggle that's going on. And so PrayForTogo.com really is the uh, one place to go for all the information that you need to help support this International Day of Prayer on Sabbath. Thanks, Dwayne. Thank you. Coming up, we have a preview of the current issue of Elder's Digest. I was once in the town of Ljubljana in Slovenia. Across the river was a bridge where romantics from all over the world attached love padlocks with their names written on. These locks were locked and the keys thrown away to signify their eternal love for one another. Padlocks rust, people change, relationships end, but Jesus' love is everlasting. My eyes were closed, and I was waiting for something to happen. My son was dying in front of my very eyes, and I cried out again as I heard my wife praying beside me, God have mercy on us and save my son. All around the world, Seventh-day Adventists are reading one chapter of the Bible per day. We call it Revived by His Word. Please join in and visit the Revived by His Word website. Open today's reading and read the accompanying blog. Add your comments or read the comments of others. Get the Google Calendar to remind you or download the printable calendar of the reading program. Learn more about Revived by His Word and how you can tell others about this project. Welcome back. Alfredo Garcia Marenco has a look this week at what you can expect to find in the current issue of Elder's Digest. In today's preview, we are happy to tell you that the fourth quarter 2013 issue of the Elder's Digest magazine contains a special emphasis on stewardship. I believe that elders and other leaders around the world will enjoy the reading and will gladly teach the stewardship principles and compass there. That, of course, is in addition to the regular menu of relevant articles with leadership strategies, didactic tools, health tips for elders, news around the world, sermon outlines, worldwide initiatives, questions and answers, Seventh-day Adventist official uh, statements, and other biblical sound topics. More than 200,000 leaders around the world are getting the Elders Digest magazine in 14 languages so far. English, French, Portuguese, Russian, Spanish, Polish, Bulgarian, Italian, Romanian, Indonesian, Tagalog, Bahasa, Chinese, and Swahili. Praise God for His wonderful blessings and for the hard work of the Ministerial Association counterparts around the world leading the translations into 13 languages and counting. Please get your subscription and order the New Elders Handbook recently released from your local ministerial association office, the one that I have in my hands. Please visit our recently upgraded website to access past issues of the English version of the magazine and the recently posted translated versions along with new leadership resources to strengthen our beloved church. God bless you. The Adventist Church's longest serving volunteer is making quality Christian education a reality for hundreds of underprivileged students in Southeast Asia. Ricky Oliveris recently met her and has this story. I recently traveled to Southeast Asia where I had the privilege of meeting Dr. Helen Hall. Helen Hall is originally from Australia but now works as an Adventist volunteer service worker. She has been in the mission field for more than 40 years 
making her the longest serving volunteer worker the Adventist Church has ever seen. When I heard about her, I had to go see her for myself, so I got on a plane and flew to Southeast Asia. I was amazed by what I saw when I got there. Helen runs a school, and she runs it really well. The school isn't made up of new facilities and it doesn't have the latest technology and gadgets. The students study under bamboo huts and type on typewriters. But the workers are so dedicated to giving the students a quality Adventist education. But what inspired me the most was seeing how Helen's trust in God has allowed her to help hundreds of students graduate, many of who would never have had the opportunity otherwise. Meeting Helen Hall and seeing her dedication to mission was such an incredible experience for me, and I'll never forget it. Now let's turn to Megan Bronner for a look at some of this week's Adventist social media highlights. This week in social media, the Adventist Church is demanding justice for imprisoned pastor Antonio Montero as he reaches his 500th day of incarceration. You can help by joining the social media campaign. Visit the Adventist Church Facebook page to get your own 500 days of injustice, cover image, and profile photo. Share your support by using the hashtag PrayForTogo500 and tweeting about your local 500 Days of Injustice events. Check out the Adventist Church Twitter page for quick, retweetable summaries of the articles released by ANN last week. And of course, make sure to read the four article series on ANN's website. Also, don't forget to share the official Pray for Togo video, which you can find and download on the official website. If your church is having a 500 Days of Injustice event, make sure someone shares photos and tweets during the event using the official hashtag. Share your 500 Days of Injustice photos and updates with us on the Adventist Church Facebook page and we will highlight them in next week's episode. And that's your social media news for this week. We have another installment this week from our ongoing series on the Adventist Church's history and development. Danya Aragon has this report. In the very early days, Adventists had a very limited view of mission. They thought that it extended to the Pacific Ocean and then to the Atlantic Ocean in the United States. They saw that the United States was a melting pot of different immigrants coming in and they thought that when you read Matthew chapter 28 and says, go ye into all the world, then we can do it right here in North America. Então você vê que entre 1843, 44, né, na época do, do movimento Millerita, do desapontamento, até 1863, que nós estamos fazendo 150 anos agora, né, da, do, da, da organização oficial da igreja, ninguém se falou praticamente em enviar missionários. O primeiro missionário foi só enviado praticamente 10 anos depois. But then their vision expanded and they realized that when Matthew 28 says, go ye into all the world, it means go ye into all the world. And so you see in the 1870s that missionaries started going to Europe, then in the 1880s to the other major continents, and then the church just didn't stop, it just kept growing. It kept expanding its vision for taking the good news about Jesus to all the world. The essence of the movement was in the mission. This was the element that made the Adventist message spread rapidly. We are a missionary church, but it concerns me that as we grow, we become more institutionalized, and there is a tendency to start looking inward. But our focus needs to be, how do we take this good news outside of the parameters we've already established and actually uh, reach new people groups and new geographical areas? The sense of mission led the initiatives of the Seventh-day Adventists for more than 150 years. However, the greatest challenge is to keep the missionary spirit despite the growth and even as time goes by. Now the problem is if we are not involved in mission, we become a pew warmer. We become a member of a, a religious social club where we come to church on Sabbath morning. We pray, we sing nice songs, we shake hands and smile and have a nice time, then we go home and that's it. That is playing a game. And when we find churches that are fighting with each other, arguing over the worship service, arguing over theology, I can guarantee you that 99% of the time, they are not focused on mission. In 1874, J.N. Andrews departed as the church's first official missionary, worked for nine years in Europe, and died in the field. 
Andrews asked that no eulogy was written because he believed that focus should be in the mission and not on the missionary. The reluctant, the editors of the review agreed. Nevertheless, a great eulogy continues to be written as many young people and families leave places like this university that carries his name to take the message all around the world as he once did. Ele foi escolhido para ser o, o patrono, diria, dessa universidade porque por causa de duas características. O primeiro, ele foi o primeiro missionário adventista. E o segundo, porque ele foi o primeiro erudito ou estudioso adventista de uma certa envergadura, né? E eu diria que hoje eu vejo os jovens missionários, mas eu vejo que falta a parte do erudito dos estudos. Se existe um movimento adventista, é porque também existe uma missão de Deus para esse movimento. I am firmly convinced. I have been. I've lived for this my whole life. This is God's people. God is going to see us through the full journey. He is going to take us home. Not a shadow of doubt about that. We have to be sure that on the way, while we are still here, that we are doing the things that God has asked us to do. Still ahead on ANN, advice for dating couples. But up next, what a closer look at birds can reveal about creation. It takes faith to believe that God is the designer of life. But when I examine science and I examine the, the perfect order of the world, the perfect order of cells, the perfect order of the atom, the perfect order of the electrons, all of these from matter to submatter point to a perfect and an orderly being. I believe that God is the originator of all life. Um, I pray for wisdom from God to do really good in school and to do really good um, in piano and my piano lessons. I pray that all the people that are sick can come, become well and whoever needs food should get food and be happy. Please pray seven in the morning, seven in the evening, and seven days a week. It is a story of struggle, but in the end, it is one of triumph. It is one of hope. We need something that can give us a real path to the future. This book can do it. I think it's a great book to be able to share with people who truly, truly do not yet know Jesus, but want to know a better way. I love learning about my ancestors. It makes me feel like I have a place in history. And I always tell my family, the more you learn about your past, the more you understand the present. But the past doesn't have all the answers, you know, especially about the future. There's so much uncertainty and so much fear in the world today. Which is why I'm so happy that I found something that brings together my past, my present, and my future. I know that no matter what happens, there is a plan. And this gives me hope. Welcome back. Adventist scientists observe signs of God throughout nature. Tim Standish says a new documentary on birds offers striking evidence of intelligent design. Appreciating what birds do has been the work of many scientists' lifetimes. And artists like John James Audubon have built their careers around painting, sculpting, photographing and filming birds. How can anyone not be astonished by the splendor and engineering brilliance evident in avian flight. The amazing thing is that anyone can look at a bird and remain blind to the wisdom behind their design, yet some do. Fully appreciating how elegantly designed birds are is probably impossible, even among those who know the Creator God and believe that it is His brilliance behind these exquisite creatures. But this does not mean that there is no way of gaining a better understanding. 
A new documentary has just been released by Illustra Media entitled Flight, the Genius of Birds. Many of you will be familiar with Illustra Media's amazing documentaries about design in nature, having seen films such as Metamorphosis and Unlocking the Mystery of Life. Each one is a masterpiece, but it could be argued that Flight is the best and most beautiful Illustra documentary yet. I'm convinced that it contains the best sequence ever put together on film illustrating the development of a bird inside an egg. Then there is the beautiful segment on how hummingbirds hover that shows the movements necessary inside their shoulder joints. On a larger scale, scenes of starling murmurations and the amazing migration of arctic terns are breathtaking. I've taught ornithology at the university level and still learned amazing things that I was previously unaware of when watching Flight. This documentary is an amazing new resource for those who wish to learn more about the creation and wish to do so while experiencing an awe-inspiring work of art. Now let's turn to John Beckett for our Tech Corner. This week he has pointers on choosing an external battery for your smartphone. I'm sure that every once in a while you pick up your phone on the way out the door, you look down and, oh no, only 15% charge remaining. You forgot to put it on the charger overnight. Well, there are lots of options for keeping your phone or your tablet's battery charged up while on the go. First, most phones can charge off a USB connection. Just pack your cable and plug it into your computer. I don't recommend plugging your phone into a computer that you don't trust though, because that computer could download data from it. Another very obvious option for those with a long car drive is a car charger. This is very handy if you use your phone as a GPS. There are now also many kinds of battery packs you can buy to charge up phones and other mobile devices. If you're trying to charge a tablet, make sure that the pack puts out enough power for it. My phone's an iPhone, so the ones I'm showing today are external packs. If I used an Android, I might have been able to just pick up an extra battery pack that I swap into the phone. First that I'm going to show is my giant external battery. This one is my kid's favorite, and it's designed to provide more life for a laptop, so it can recharge a phone a whole bunch of times. It is really big and heavy, and it even requires its own charger. There are also lots of smaller batteries that are kind of similar to this that you can charge using your phone's charger can't charge your phone as many times with one though. Another very nice option is a combination battery pack phone case. These are great because they provide extra protection and can double the time that you go between charges. At night you plug your cable in to charge both the phone and the battery together. And the phone just slides into it like that. With all these options I'm sure you can find one that will give you a bit of extra charge while you're on the go. Is your significant other marriage material? On this month's feature from Family Ministries, Willie and Elaine Oliver explain how dating purposefully can set you on the path to a lasting relationship. One of the uh, important questions that we get asked a lot is, how long should you date before getting married? Yeah, that's one of my favorite questions, actually, because um, we're, we're extremely opinionated on this, but it's not just our opinion. A lot of what we share with people about this is based on research. And one of the things that we believe is that when people are dating, especially when we're talking about people that are in a position to think about marriage, so we're talking about um, mature adults, because only mature adults should enter into marriage. That's right. um, and so when it comes to dating, if you are in the position to think about marriage, that the person that you're dating you really think is a marriage prospect, then you probably, within the first three months, we recommend that people start doing some type of pre-engagement counseling. We're talking about age once you're out of college. Correct. Someone who's over Mature 22. Mature adults, yes. yes. So when we're talking about how long should you date, we're talking about beginning after in right. your 20s. Because what happens too often is that people will just date um, nebulously, uh, you know, just without any plan just in going mind out with someone. for a year before long, it's two years. And right. so what we're saying is at three months, if you think this person is an eligible partner, then you should really start having some serious conversations, not to be married, but to think about if this person is an eligible so marriage partner. So at least a year, so that you can know the person, know their family, and know what they're about, and be sure that they love Christ the way you love Christ. Absolutely. 
In a new video series, Adventist World Church President Ted Wilson invites viewers to accept God's many gifts. This week's gift is stewardship. God has given to each one of us the gift of stewardship. That is the responsibility of taking care of things that belong to Him. Of course, that includes the world and all that it contains. It also includes the financial resources He has entrusted to us. He asks us to show our trust in Him by returning 10% back to Him, along with our free will offerings. He also asks us to be good caretakers of our bodies, which are His temple. What a privilege it is to follow His leading in keeping our bodies as healthy as possible and free from anything that might dishonor our Creator. When we accept God as the one who gave us everything, we care for His gifts with respect and sensitivity. Accept His gift of stewardship today. Now let's turn to Benjamin Baker for a look at Adventist history. This week, milestones in the life of the church's first overseas missionary. Welcome to This Week in Adventist History, one of the most pivotal in our 150 years. On July 22, in 1829, John Nevins Andrews was born. Pioneer, minister, administrator, author, theologian, and missionary, Andrews literally gave his life to advance the great Second Advent movement, dying from overwork in the mission field of Switzerland at age 54. On July 24, 1915, Ellen Gold White was buried next to her husband in the Oak Hill Cemetery in Battle Creek, Michigan, there to await the last trump. On the same day, but in 1983, the New Review and Herald Publishing Association plant in Hagerstown, Maryland, USA, officially opened. In 1980, the Southern Publishing Association in Nashville, Tennessee, was merged with the Review and Herald, then in Tacoma Park, Maryland, and a larger facility was needed to accommodate both entities. A farm in Hagerstown was selected as an optimal location and under the leadership of Harold Bud Otis, a state-of-the-art facility was constructed. July 25, 1918, saw the death of George Ide Butler, one of the pillars of early Adventism. Butler served as GC president for almost a dozen years. The next day in 1855, the early Adventist poet, hymnist, and editorial assistant Annie Smith died. Listen to her immortal words. Oh, what can buoy the spirits up? Tis this alone, the blessed hope. And that's this week in Adventist history. Thanks for watching ANN. Join us next week for more news from the headquarters of the Seventh-day Adventist Church. In the meantime, find us on Facebook. You can connect with other Adventists worldwide and find links to more stories, photos, and videos. Just visit Facebook slash Adventist News. Our good news for this week comes from Psalms. The passage says, O he who dwells in the shelter of the Most High will rest in the shadow of the Almighty. I will say of the Lord, He is my refuge and my fortress, my God in whom I trust. That's our program for this week, and remember you can always visit news.avenus.org for daily news and videos. Until next time, God bless. Take care.